This is the American Law Journal. We live in a world of joint legal custody, meaning both parents have a right to say how their kids are raised. But what if the rules in your ex's house differ wildly from yours? Good evening, I'm Christopher Naughton. Welcome to ALJ. And tonight we take a look at raising the kids. What do divorced parents actually fight about? How can you handle it? How does your lawyer help you? Gina Passarella with the Legal Intelligencer has this. And across American jurisprudence, parenting one's child is a fundamental human right and liberty. And mine was stripped absent any due process. Now, Raising the kids after divorce. If parents don't agree how, they may be headed to court. You know, I think about what happens when people fight and the people who benefit are the lawyers. So you ought to try to work it out. But the modern family landscape makes that difficult. A generation ago, the lines were bright. Mom got custody and generally raised the kids. So I've seen a large shift over the course of the past 20 years from primary physical custody being a norm to shared custody or a variation of shared custody. Joint legal custody, which by the way I've always felt was the bigger issue. Getting two people who couldn't agree on what toothpaste to use in the bathroom are suddenly going to agree on all these things about their kids. The courts this, at this point are really leaning towards 50-50. Joint legal custody. Ideally, both parents have equal say in raising the children. But how does that work when norms between households are bound to be different? If one parent has no bedtime and the child is staying up till 12, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, playing video games unsupervised in the basement, that becomes more serious and a court may get involved with something like that. But courts may not be equipped to handle what divorced parents seem to argue about most these days. Social media, um, young children with cell phones. Technology and devices and internet. What's happening is that children are less engaged with face-to-face -face and social interactions and social development because a lot more is, you know, this, where they're craning their necks. If and mom and dad can't figure it out, it doesn't mean the judge will. Courts lose perspective on appropriate age for children having access to the internet and having access to a cell phone. The courts are really not up to speed as fast as everyone else is. So a lot of the judges and even the attorneys are just kind of grappling with the issues. Besides technology, the latest custody disputes deal with homeschooling, child passports and air travel, corporal punishment, and... Stupid things like introducing the new girlfriend or the new boyfriend, which suddenly makes everybody crazy. In the end, even in a joint legal custody era, where the child spends most of his time may best determine how he will be brought up. In the vast majority of cases, legal custody is shared, who makes decisions for the kids. So having possession of the children or having primary possession gives you a lot of power. It's clear that custody cases are just as contentious as they've always been. But now enter technology. The courts and lawyers are trying to play catch up to how to handle things like Facebook, Instagram, even emails and text messages. So while the courts and lawyers deal with those issues, they still advise clients to keep the best interest of the children at the fore. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, let's talk to a therapist and three lawyers who join me tonight. Don Spry returns to our program. Don has been providing commentary on family law issues right here on ALJ for 23 years and running. We're very lucky to have him. Dr. Deborah Castaldo, I'd like to welcome her back to the program, a therapist for 25 plus years, heads up the Center for Couples and Family Solutions. Her latest book is Relationship Reboot. Her offices stand in the shadow of New York City in Englewood, New Jersey. Mary Venus steps up to the plate for the very first time tonight from the internationally renowned law firm of Blank Rome. We've had many of her partners on many times before. Uh, Mary is a partner with the firm and she is the current vice chair of the American Bar Association's Family Law Section. And our returning champion is David LaDove with Obermeyer Redman in Greater Philadelphia, co-chair of their family law group and also the past chair of the Pennsylvania Bar Association's Family Law Section. We're not taking your telephone calls tonight, folks. If you have a question on this or any other legal topic that we cover here on ALJ, go to our website, lawjournaltv.com, or write to us at info at lawjournaltv.com. Okay, I think to the layperson, Mary, that people are thinking, really? People go into court and they fight over screen time and they fight over how long Junior's got uh, the, the phone and how much time he spends on the internet? Chris, 
when they're fighting in a divorce, they're going to fight over anything, you know. And keep in mind that 15 years ago, children didn't have computers in school. They weren't doing all their homework on the computers. They weren't given computers. Now, our, the kids that are, you know, the five, the six-year-olds, they're getting iPads at that age. They're much more technologically proficient and, sent, you know, smarter about what there is out there in terms of communicating. Think about, you know, our kids nowadays are on Facebook, Twitter, any kind of social networking. And the, the problem is, is that one parent doesn't believe it's appropriate and another parent does, that's what the court is for. In Pennsylvania, you know, you're going to fight over a legal custody issue about technology, you're going to end up in court. But Dave, does that become like the bone of contention or maybe more like Mary saying, uh, you're really not, you're rarely fighting over the things you think you're fighting about? Well, if they start down a road, you never know where that road's going to lead them. And technology is an easy one. I mean, just a simple question as to what age do you give your kid a cell phone? And when the kids are going back and forth between two houses, you know, you, you have to think, wouldn't it be easier for, their, for the kids to have a cell phone in case one parent doesn't pick the kids up or in case one of the kids is running late or et cetera, et cetera. But just that, okay, is it appropriate that an eight-year-old have a cell phone? Should it be a 10-year-old, 12-year-old? Pick your age. They're going to fight about it. Usually you're going to have one cell phone. You're going to hope that it's going to go back and forth. <laughs> you're going to hope, and you're going to hope that it would, if it's at one parent's house, it's going to be charged. Because right. I can tell you, I know Dave and I and Don have had many stories of how the child takes the cell phone back and forth, but they can never get the child on the cell phone, and the child then tells the other parent, yeah, well, mom wouldn't let me charge it, or dad wouldn't let me charge it, or mom or dad took it away from me and said, I'll get it back when you're going back. <laughs> right. We hear that all the time. Right. Yeah. And, and Dr. Deb, I, I, I've got to imagine from your, from your standpoint as well, in therapy, uh, these same kind of issues uh, crop up. And I, I don't think there are any bright lines in your profession either. Absolutely. And most of these issues predate the divorce conflicts. Um, I always say that what happens in the divorce was already happening in the marriage. I don't think those issues go away. They get worse. And I have people fighting over all of these issues of, you know, even two-year-olds running around the house with an iPhone, and that parent doesn't want the other parent to see the inside of the house any longer. So as little as two, we're having issues with where you put the iPhone, where you Skype, do you Skype, uh, when children sometimes don't even understand the meaning of it. So sometimes you actually are going into court, Don, and, and a judge has to make that decision for your client. Well, unfortunately, yeah. I mean, it's the last resort. It um, sounds sad it, that it's not worked out before. Well, it's typically a lot of other issues as well. I mean, I think as Dave and Mary had, had talked about it, I mean, yes, you get into those cell phone issues, those technology issues, but there's usually a lot more, and that's just part of it. Um, it's usually a full panoply of issues, unfortunately. That's usually not the only issue. Mm -hmm. Let's segue here. Let me put it in two words, adult sleepovers. So we've got mom and dad, they're divorced, and now dad's got a girlfriend, maybe mom's got a boyfriend. Isn't the general rule of thumb you don't introduce the son or the daughter to a new girlfriend or boyfriend until after six months? Uh, i got to take umbrage to that. Take umbrage, um, Dave. I, no way is there any guideline that I've I seen recently. Right. Um, you know, when you talk about escalation of emotions, there's nothing that escalates that problem greater than the introduction of the children to the new boyfriend or girlfriend. That right. just is like the skyrocket goes off. Right, so are you telling me, Dave, that judges are just making up out of whole cloth? They've just uh, got to just check which way the wind is blowing. If dad's got a new girlfriend and he's been dating, with, or dating her for three weeks and she's coming over on a Saturday night and the kids are there and the mother screams bloody murder, does she have... Uh, any legal grounds to stand on whatsoever if this becomes legally contentious? I, I do believe that most judges will use what I'm going to just say is common sense, that there needs to be some period uh, for an introduction, some period of a get to know. Um, Mary and I were talking about this a little earlier. You know, we tell our clients if you don't have custody that weekend, have your sleepovers that weekend, not when you have your kids. Um, but you know. is that the kind of thing that you as an attorney sit down and say look unless you want to go to a court unless you want to go before a judge <laughs> just just shift it around right absolutely we do and and I think most of us 
um, while we are cognizant of we don't want to lose a client, we're also cognizant of you really don't want to be the, on the bad end of that kind of a, a suit in front of the judge who's going to then go decide your economic issues mm -hmm. three months from now. Yeah, um, I, don't be stupid. I, I, think, I think two things. I think, uh, Dave, you know, in some of the areas I practice, there's a rule of thumb of six months. Yeah. Obviously, there's other places where there's not. I think what a judge is primarily interested in is um, the strength of the relationship and understanding that people are going to move on with their lives. Yes. So, you know, people are going to meet other people. And, and Dave's exactly right. I, I think you need to be discreet. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, you know, it's sort of like uh, uh, one of the spouses bringing their new significant other to the divorce hearing. It's, it's just a, not a smart thing to do. And, you know? I, and I think Don and both Dave are both through, but I think it also matters how the children react to it. You know, the children, you said something about after the divorce and the sleepovers. Many times these sleepovers occur before the divorce, mm -hmm. and the children are already going through a significant transition. They're already That's going That's got to tick off a judge if it comes before I a don't, judge. It, it depends. It really does really? depend. Um, it depends how the child reacts. It also depends what age of the child. You're talking about a younger child, you know, under the age of six. I've had a case where the father, and I still have this case, where the father, I have the mom, is going on J-date and, and looking at the profiles and asking his children to pick out a new mom for him, for them. You know, totally inappropriate, totally going to upset a judge, but, you know, that's what they're doing because at their point, they may be the one who felt abandoned because of the other spouse left, but it's really the impact on the child. And going back to you, Dr. Deb, isn't it, I mean, it's, it's onus is upon both a therapist, and I would hope the court system, I want to hear from the lawyers here in a second, that someone's got to prepare these kids so that they're not blindsided. Absolutely, and I have a very simple guideline, actually. Um, I don't think there should be any introduction or exposure until that parent believes that they're going to be in a serious relationship with that person. So for me, it's not about a number of months. It's do you really feel this is going towards a permanent relationship? And then there has to be a progression of talking to the children, getting them used to the idea, and then moving towards introduction in some prepared kind of way so it's not traumatic. You know what, Chris, in this discussion, I think the one unrealistic point here is yeah. so often it's not someone new. It's someone who's, you know, their kid's friend's parent. It's they go to school together. They're, they sit at the same little league or, or baseball team together. And, you know, as we know, and I, I, I'm going to get bashed for this one, guys are lazy. They find the, the easiest, closest relationship they can find. Um, I'm not bashing you because it's true. Yeah, I mean, that's our experience. And, and so it's like, you know, the mom of, of one of the kid's friends um, because they're at the, the, the parent things together or the, the, the little league together, as I said. And, you know, when you start to say it's an introduction, it's not really an introduction. They've known this person for three to five years. Right. It's just the relationship is now and, starting and, to change. And, again, uh, they may know that person, yes. but then isn't that line crossed, uh, crossed when that person comes for the so-called sleepover? Absolutely. Right. Um, I'm not arguing it. I'm just saying. But, I mean, but then that becomes. Now, again, how does that show up, Dave, as a bone of contention in a custody matter? Mom's going crazy. Yeah. Right. You know, this is our kid's friend, and you're now sleeping with the mother. You know, what, what kind of role model are you? How stupid, you know. Or, or dad's going crazy. Because exactly. mom has another relationship right. Right. that he didn't know about right. during the marriage, and then mom's bringing in the guy to sleep over. And if someone's really looking for primary physical custody, which, again, these days is probably rare, uh, that's the time that you're probably going to try to use that wedge in a court of law. Well, what I'm going to say is, if that is your goal, you want to be, you want to be, you want to walk into court with, with clean hands. Yes. Yeah. You want to know that you haven't done anything that will adversely impact that child's relationship, A, with the other parent or their own psychological thing. If they're going to come into court, and any child over the age of six, the court has the ability to speak to, you know, and that child comes in and says, I don't want to be at my dad's house or my mom's house because I don't like their boyfriend because in a way, not because the person's bad or anything, or it's because that person has broken up that, that marriage. Kids want their parents to stay together. But I do agree with Deb, too, that it's got to be something, someone that this person's going to have a 
permanent fixture in your even though there are no guarantees. But at least it's not a revolving door of women or men out the out the house. When does the court get involved in making sure that these kids, as I asked Dr. Deb, that they're not blindsided? What what does the law do? Not just a therapist. What do does the law do? The courts, the lawyers, do they do so that they're preparing their kids for this? Or is that really not within you know the the ambit or the scope of what it is that the legal system should well, do. I don't think the courts do anything at all. Right. They don't uh, tell people they've got to go see a therapist. In other words, if you're, in other words, unless it well, once become, you get there, once you yeah. obviously, yeah, right. But beforehand, they're not placing any guidelines. Though. I think the lawyers, right. I mean, as Dave was saying, I, it's really something that the lawyers would try to do. Um, and and I think you know, my experience is children, at least young children, are typically very difficult witnesses. They're, they're in a loyalty bind. They don't want to bash either parent. So they're probably not going to say in a court, or may well not say in a courtroom right. whatever they told you they were going to say. Let's uh, segue to something else that you folks didn't have to deal with 15, 20, or more years ago, and that would be internet schooling and homeschooling. Homeschooling was nascent uh, probably in the 1990s, 80s, 90s. Not very prevalent, let's put it that way. But today, homeschooling is a lot more popular. And this, too, becomes a huge bone of contention, something that, let's face it, you weren't prepared for this when you went to law school. You weren't prepared for the first decade or so when you were practicing. Now it's on the radar screen. Now you have to deal with it. How prevalent is it, and how do you deal with it? Well, I've run into it, um, and, and I think one of the one of the major issues that I found with homeschooling in the custody context is, is supervision or lack of supervision. Um, one of the cases that I was involved with, the issue was what was the supervision of the parent that was homeschooling, and the argument from my client's side was there was no supervision, and the student was doing Xbox and all kinds of things that he shouldn't have been doing, um, wasn't meeting the uh, triggers that were supposed to be to be met and they have to present a portfolio under the statute. Um, so that, that was the issue that I ran into. Now you do see it from some, sometimes for religious reasons, sometimes for bullying reasons where the parents pull the children out of school because they feel they're being bullied. So there's logical reasons to do it and the courts in Pennsylvania have not taken a value position. In other words, saying homeschooling is better or not better. Right. It's a case by case basis. Right. The bright line is if during the intact marriage yes. Yes. they made a decision to homeschool their child right. or children and then the divorce happens and one parent says, nope, I don't want the children homeschooled anymore. I want them in public school or a private school. Then I think there's a, a difference. But if during the marriage they made a joint decision to homeschool their child, then that was a decision they made as a as a unit. And they've established a and pattern. They, and they've established a pattern. Now, right. could those patterns change? Sure. A, a child that's homeschooled through elementary school may not be for, particularly for socialization skills, and it depends on the child, may need to go or be integrated into a regular school when they go to high school. Um, I, I, don't th I think every child is different, and it really depends on the child and what that child's needs are. And as Don said, whether they're being met, whether they're being proper, properly supervised. I mean, there are, there are legends of children who were homeschooled completely who have gone on to Ivy League colleges at 16 because mm -hmm. they're so much further ahead than their peers. Right. Whether they're socially adept is a different issue. Now, Dave, I, I suspect sometimes, and again, maybe I'm showing my biases, maybe it's more the man who, who feels like, hey, my kid's not involved in sports, he's not being socialized, I want him out of the home school, uh, the wife's just trying to use this because she doesn't want to go to work, uh, maybe she wants the financial benefit, what have you, I want my kids socialized. Yeah, I think part of it is a socialization and part of it is a control issue. That, you know, how many hours is my son or daughter going to be with his or her mother versus how many hours I have. And, and there's no doubt in my mind, parents in a contested custody count not overnights, they count hours. Yeah. Um, and the schooling issue, I agree with Mary wholeheartedly, is what did they do when the family was intact? And that's going to be, I think, the controlling determination uh, for the most part. But let's just say that you know, they didn't do it, and now all of a sudden mom wants to homeschool and picks up the bullying issue or picks up the kids, you know, in is, is it adolescence and having difficulty with the peer group. And, and, of course, you know, mom's coming in to rescue the kid out of this horrible situation. And just as you said, Chris, dad's like, no, no, no. That, there's learning, not just book learning, 
There's people learning. There's life learning. There's life lessons, and those are just as important. And I'm not agreeing to this homeschooling stuff. This is the holding in a case uh, that came down from Pennsylvania, in 2008. I don't know why they even bothered to write this down, but here it is. Whether a child should attend public school or be homeschooled would be decided on a case-by-case -case basis by examining the best interest of the child. I, th I think that's family law 101. I'm not really sure, but that, I think, really sums it up in some ways. It's a difficult issue, and I know another big case came down in Pennsylvania a few years back where they held that a child with special needs, which the public school staff were trained to address and the mother was not addressing, that's when they said, yeah, the child should attend public school. But it still goes back to point A, best interest of the child, case-by-case -case basis. Absolutely. But Let's I, go. I also go think, Chris, it does get intertwined with economics sometimes. Yes. Because the, the, right. point, the point's well taken. That if during, uh, prior to divorce, you were doing homeschooling, but then after the separation with two households, the argument is sometimes we can't, we, we made that decision in an intact family, but we can't afford it anymore. Right. And I think that was upheld in one case, um, although I don't know that that argument is going to prevail in cases where you're just using it as a subterfuge. Right. Um, but you know, the argument sometimes is the person wants to homeschool so they can continue to receive spousal support or alimony pendente vitae. Right, right. Which I kind of inferred in in, in the previous uh, example, but. You're saying you're probably not going to get away with that. So you're not going to pull a ruse over a judge uh, in too many instances if, if it looks like you're just doing it for pecuniary reasons. It would have to be real. Yeah. It would have to be real. And, right. you know, it's, if, if a child was homeschooled and then, you know, the father or the mother came in, and by the way, it is equal. You know, there are many fathers that stay home and raise mm -hmm. their children and are homeschooling while the moms are out working. Um, uh, we've seen a big change in that um, uh, over the last... 15 years that you know the father's been the father stayed at home and homeschooled the children and now you know the mother they're getting divorced maybe because the mother is tired of being the primary wage earner and the father says no I'm going to continue to homeschool my children or, or vice versa it doesn't you know it doesn't really matter it's the issues the same but again I think a court is going to be more likely to say that no, this child can remain homeschooled, providing a the child's doing well, the child's meeting all the tr state triggers, the child's doing everything because it, a true homeschool is going to make sure the kid, the child has socialization, has you know is ahead of the is a, is being tested properly, is being properly supervised. Uh, let's go to, to a, we've only got a few minutes left, and I really want to cover a few things very quickly. Another one is interesting: airplane travel. Judges do determine this, Dave LaDove, do they not? This issue comes up, and they've got to deal with it. Absolutely they do. And, you know, you have, I'll just call it the prevalent safety issue. You know, when is it safe for a kid to travel alone? And all the airlines have their own standards, and, and even the airlines, most of them are the same, but not all. Uh, and when can the kid be alone? When does a kid need a, a companion, et cetera? But... Um, the whole issue of the distances, you know, we get into, is it a direct flight? Is there a stopover? Um, does the kid have a cell phone? The age of the kid? And then you get the other side of the coin where the overprotective parent is, I don't want my kid flying at all. I'm a little incredulous. You folks practice in it every day that these kind of issues would actually end up in front of a judge. But like all of you have been saying, it's usually you know, just the tip of the iceberg or just one factor among many, uh, and, and yet it ends up going to court. So you have a judge making the determination, yes, Junior can fly. Yep. Not, to, not to San Francisco, just to Milwaukee or what have you. You have a judge. I'm going to court on Thursday on, wh on whether a parent can get passports for the children. Yeah, you I've know, um, And then who's going to hold the passports? passports? Because neither one trusts the other to hold the passports. Um, you know, or the consent to travel. When is the consent to travel going to be executed? Or what happens if the parent doesn't execute it? So that you know, children can travel with a parent out of the country. Here's um, another issue that we didn't have to deal with uh, a generation ago, again, 10, 15, 20 years ago, because it was never raised, the whole notion of corporal punishment. I mean, when I was raised as a child, if a kid got hit, well, he probably deserved it. That, that meant the school teacher <laughs> or the nun as well. We never asked questions of that, and certainly the law back in those days, unless someone was, was hurt uh, very, very badly, the law never questioned whether a parent could administer corporal punishment or not. And now we have court cases, whether holding, smacking a child and hitting a child with a belt 
so that the child has welts uh, to the level of abuse. A court in Pennsylvania five, six years ago said it's abuse. It's too much. How often do you see this, Don, when you're in I your have, practice? I have not, I haven't seen it a lot with my clientele, but I mean, I, I think it's a change in mores. I mean, you know, one point children were chattel and that, you know, it's, it's moved on. Um, I'm familiar with the case that talked about the belt. I think today that sort of punishment would uh, not be looked on well by a court. Um, Under any circumstances? No. Okay. I don't think so. Right. So a lot of our parents in our generation would have been out of luck <laughs> with <Probably>. that. <laughs> Maybe. Shoes, yes. belt, spoons, whatever, whatever. Whereas they could reach for Don. <laughs> um, that's yeah. right. And, and Dr. Deb, uh, obviously you're, you're probably saying, wow, it's, it's, it's about time that the law caught up with us therapists. Absolutely. And caught up with child welfare practices. You know, when we talk about belts and objects and things, um, that's clearly reportable. Um, you know, and I'm sitting here thinking how sad it is that parents can't come to resolution on these issues. And obviously, they probably wouldn't have gotten divorced if they could. Um, just going back for a second about the airplane travel or the type of discipline or really all of the issues we've talked about tonight. When there isn't communication, the sad thing is that the children end up being um, the pawns, the chattel, as you just said before. You know, I don't know that we've come really that far. I think that is the underlying core root of um, the problem here for children is that they do get caught in the crossfire on all these issues. Got it. Let's uh, let's end up where we began. Let's uh, let's go back to technology, and maybe this is a happy thing, but. Uh, again, 15, 20 years ago, no one would come into court and say, well, Judge, the child doesn't have to travel to San Francisco because mom and, and junior can Skype or they can FaceTime. How does it factor in I, in a I, custody battle? I think it factors in into more, more, more relocation cases mm -hmm. where more contact in between the parent and the relocating child is through Skyping FaceTime. Um, it's, it's a vehicle out there. Does it replace? Right. Because that's what we get from our clients. It, it's not the same as when I can put my son or daughter to bed and give them a kiss and read them a story at night. But you can read a story on Skype. But Don, isn't that you sometimes as a wedge to say, look, I'm going to relocate, but dad can always talk to his daughter. Well, I was just going to say, Skype. if you're advocating for the person who's relocating, Skype's the best thing in the world. <laughs> if you're left behind, you, you, you know, it's not like putting somebody to bed, hugging them. It's, it's not that interaction. Right. So, yeah, I, I agree. It helps. But... Um, that's what's always argued when, when you're trying to relocate. Right. And uh, I think with varying degrees of success. And again, uh, all of these issues are looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, there are so many other things that I wanted to get to tonight, but time has run out on us, so we'll have to get to things such as religious choice and, and uh, HIV issues, drug issues, et cetera, et cetera, and all the wonderful and actually challenging things that you folks have to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Don Spry with King Spry, Herman Freund, and Fall in the greater Lehigh Valley, 30-plus uh, years in practice. And again, he has graced us on this set here for now almost a quarter century. Uh, Don has argued cases before his own Supreme Court, and I, I, I always thank him for bringing his knowledge uh, to the table. Dr. Deb Castaldo, after not seeing Dr. Deb for a few years, again, a therapist for 25-plus years, returned to the program tonight. Check out her book, Relationship Reboot. She heads up the Center for Couples and Family Solutions in Englewood, New Jersey. Mary Venus, partner with Blank Rome. And uh, in 2016, she became the chair of the American Bar Association's Family Law Section. And uh, just an all-around good guy, David Ledove tonight, uh, joining us once again from Obermeyer, Redmond, and uh, co-chair of their Family Law Section. For all of us here at the American Law Journal, thanks for joining us this Monday night. Until next week, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Law Catalyst, legal media and marketing for lawyers. Go to lawcatalyst.com. And the Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media company and the oldest daily legal newspaper in the United States.